in the songs we discover you in the people around us as we worship this day. speaks to us. With graciousness, God forgives us. With joy, God embraces us. With, with our lips, we praise God. God. With, with our, our words, we thank God. In our with silence, we find God. In our hearts, thanks, thanks be to God. Amen. Let us invite the children to the front of the church with hymn uh, 2056, God is so good.
Uh, right? Oh, not. But has anyone here ever had to move, like move house from one place to another? <laughs> Two of you? Okay. Yeah, and did you have to pack boxes? Do you remember? Yeah. Well, you know, in my house, we play this game called Moving Day because uh, we move a lot. <laughs> and you're all laughing. They know that I move a lot. Uh, but we sometimes, if we haven't moved in the last year, we pretend to move. So uh, we play this game called Moving Day where we go through every room in the house with boxes and we say, all right, what are you going to pass along on Moving Day? We call it passing along. And we do the same thing on birthdays, the day before birthday, before Christmas, Anytime that something's going to come in to the house, things need to go. <laughs> Otherwise, it is chaos. So we pretend that it is moving day, even if it's not. And we go through, right? And when it's moving, right, you can put your things in boxes. Well, we also, maybe you did this in your family, you have to make sure you're going to let some things go. You're going to pass them along. Have you ever done this? Like if you grow out of your clothes or your toys, you put them in a box and you, and you give them, we call it the bye bye store because it's where you say bye bye to your toys. Um, but maybe you guys do that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, you pass them along to someone else who can use them, right? That, that's what we do. And so we go along and put our things in the box. And, Sometimes it's hard. Well, let's face it, usually it's hard, right? <laughs> if you're picturing your room right now in your house and mentally looking around your room, can you think of one thing that you could let go of? Okay. Oh, that car? Okay, you could let that go. What about you? Or dinosaur, do you think you could pass those along? Let go? One percent? Okay. One percent, all right. All right, how about you, Miss Rosie? So what, you could let go? Yeah. Probably some books. Yeah, books are great, right? Because they don't really go bad. They sometimes get a little worn around the edges, but, but we can always pass them along to others. Um, but yeah, so one of the things that the Bible tells us is we're supposed to let go of things, for sure, but of stuff inside of us that we want to let go to make room. For God's love for us. Uh, so sometimes, like, do you ever feel bad when you've done something you shouldn't? Yeah. Maybe you never do anything you shouldn't. I, but when we feel bad, God says, you know what? That's what we just did with this prayer. Can you put it in the moving day box? We pass it along, but this time not to another person, but to God, and God takes it. And then you have room to get rid of the bad, yucky feeling. You have room for the love feeling. So then, when you're filled up with God's love and peace, you can actually share that with other people, right? Because when you feel good inside, it's easier to be kind. <laughs> It's easier to be loving to others, right? But when you feel yucky inside and filled up with gunk, it's a lot easier to be mean, right? Yeah. So I'd like to pass this around and everybody, you don't have to say it out loud, you can if you want, put in one bad thing on your insides that you want to get rid of and give it to God for prayer.
put it in mentally, pass it along. life-giving word and fill us with your Holy Spirit, so that living water may flow through our hearts, a spring of hope for a thirsty world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The first reading is Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, there are no words, their voice is not heard, yet their voice goes through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the ends of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and nothing is hid from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The degree, decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening our eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping, with, uh, in keeping them there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the, the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> please, please join us in, in singing, um, God is so good.
second reading comes from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 8, verses 27 through 38. Listen for the word of the Lord to you. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, and take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake, for the sake of the gospel, will find it. Will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give? return for their life. And those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and of the Holy Angels. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Join your hearts with me in prayer. Holy One, I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable for your sight, our rock and our redeemer. <clears throat> so we know being a follower. It's not usually something we encourage in the United States of America. No college commencement speaker has ever congratulated the graduates on becoming the followers of tomorrow. <laughs> Nobody makes sweeping biographical history films about great world followers. <laughs> Nobody gives awards to recognize the contributions of community followers. He frames their resume to highlight where they exercise strong followership in their work. Nobody's heart swells with pride when a fellow parent comes up to them and says, you know, your kid is a real follower. Being a follower is considered weak and, and passive. It's for people who can't think for themselves, right? Being a follower is Losers. The only place I can recall being encouraged to become a follower is social media. It's all about following, right? Everywhere you go, people say, please follow my page, like me. If you follow someone, you receive everything they say. And sometimes it even appears where you are. So you have to exercise a lot of discernment about who you are going to follow. 
Well, Jesus makes a bold statement about following. He's got all these people flocking around, drawn to him by his healing and by his teaching. And people are starting to become convinced that maybe he's the Messiah, but he doesn't have the signs of the Messiah like people are used to. He doesn't, he's not gathering an army to throw a Roman occupation for one thing, is what we would expect. But he tells them, if you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake, for the sake of the gospel, will save it. I can't imagine this is a popular message. Not then, not today. Following Jesus requires a lot more than clicking a button and keeping up with him. It means actually going where he goes, doing what he does the way that he does it. Especially that real sticking phrase, right? Take up the cross. When people say, it's my cross to bear, I'm sure you've all heard this, they usually mean it's suffering that's imposed on them which must nevertheless be accepted or endured without complaint. Now, I'm not a Southerner, but I'm, I'm aware that there is sort of this strain in Southern culture of this gracious acceptance of suffering, of suffering the bearing of it as a noble endeavor. But that is not what Jesus is talking about. We do not take up our cross and follow Jesus by quietly accepting and enduring, say, the violence of a spouse or the manipulations of a drug addicted child. Suffering that is imposed on us against our will is not redemptive. And I think I need to say that again. Suffering that is imposed on us against our will is not redemptive. Suffering on the cross was not imposed on Jesus. He took it up himself, willingly, intentionally, to redeem all of us. From the outside of history, it may look like he was a person crucified by the state, right? For undermining religious authorities. But the way that we tell it in our story is that he chose it for us. So if we're to take up our cross and follow Jesus, it means we follow him in refusing to think only about ourselves, but to suffer for the redemption of others even if it risks us losing our lives. Now this may seem very dramatic, of course. We think, when am I going to take on other suffering to risk my losing my life? That almost never happens in my modern, relatively pushy life. <laughs> I remember, you know, and some of you know this about me, that I've been involved in um, nonviolent social action for many years. And John Lewis, who was the leader of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, talked about redemptive suffering. And talked about standing in the way. Maybe some of you remember this from the time. He said, if someone's being attacked and beaten, he said, it is your responsibility to intervene to protect them. But intervening does not mean returning violence with violence to drive the attacker away. Intervening means stepping in and shielding your fellow marcher with your own body, accepting the blows yourself in order to save them, even at risk to your own life. Those who 
those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake, for the sake of the gospel, will save it. In other words, following Jesus is for losers. The question is, what are we willing to lose? Now, we may not always be faced with that decision, like John Lewis, and that struggle of putting our bodies on the line. But we may be faced, as I talk to the children, with that box of what are you willing to lose, to let go of? What do you have to deny in your own life? to make room for Christ's new life in you. What will you lose? I know we've all heard a lot of talk about people's personal freedom, especially in the United States, but all over the world, with this whole mass debate and the vaccine debate. This sense that there is some God-given right to make our own choices that govern our own bodies. Sure. What are you willing to lose something so that someone else might have life? The cross calls us to be a follower of the one lost on purpose. Is there perhaps a time where we say, I will set aside my personal freedom to breathe without a mask. I will set aside that choice in order that others might live. Maybe like on moving day, we let go of takes up what takes up space in our own hearts. We do a uh, Spring cleaning, or what we call in our house, the moving day exercise. Maybe for some of you it's self-loathing. It takes up a lot of time. Let go. How about our concerns for cultural norms around gender presentation? Maybe you let that go. Do you still carry grief from an old relationship that went wrong? It's time to put it in a box, put it out on the curb. Even good things, they have their seasons. And it can be a joy to deny them, to lose them in their time. We may have loved square dancing or rock climbing, and now with age or injury, it's time to hang up the clogs or the ropes and pick up the petitions or prayer circles. Losing can be gift. I know in churches we go through our seasons of life. We had urine for 17 years and then you had a transitional pastor and soon you will embrace that new season of a first call new pastor. It's a joyous season. There's also go. It doesn't make it hurt any less. No one said that losing yourself was not going to hurt. But losing makes room for being found in Christ. Imagine this, a church that's focused on saving its own life will lose it. This is not news, I suspect. A church that spends its energy and resources saving its building rather than empowering its mission is losing its life. A, li a living church makes its building a resource for mission, not an object of it. A church seeking new members to save its budget or its influence 
A living church receives new members to nurture them as disciples, not so they can nurture the church as an institution. Using our lives for the sake of the gospel doesn't always mean death, but it does mean martyrdom. You know, we think of martyrs as people who have died for their faith, but that's not the original meaning. Martyr is just the Greek word for witness. And what does a witness do? A witness tells the truth about how you have seen and heard Jesus' saving grace in your life and in the world. Enough to get killed. But the significance wasn't actually in losing your life for your faith. The significance was in being a witness who gives testimony that you had already lost your life when Christ claimed it and that it is held safely in Christ's hands where no one on earth can reach it. Maybe our church needs to be a place where we help each other become losers. Losers of anything that keeps us from following Jesus. Fears, anxieties, our past, or our futures, our status, or our schedules, our need to be in control of our lives and our faith, anything that keeps us from losing ourselves in the abundance of grace that we receive, the love that we share, the ministry that we fulfill. As it turns out, we have a lot to lose. So let's get going, let's get going. It's moving day. All we have to do is follow. Amen. Friends, if you need community to belong to, if you are thirsty for the word of life and want to live as a disciple of Jesus, join us ministry and mission, you are welcome in the Would you rise in body or in spirit? With our hymn of response, will you come and follow me? It's number 726. <laughs>
prayer, we offer our thanks to God and ask God to help us. What do we thank God for today? Thank God for Harris's son and grandson that survived the Pentagon years ago. Thanks be to God. Thank God for a new grandson. Thank God for a new grandson for the poets.
but our lives intersect with the poor, the hungry, the hopeless, our sisters and brothers. As we seek to follow you, may we share in the abundance you have poured out on us so all might experience your grace and life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have announcements for the good of the body today. Three three year terms, two two year terms, and one one year term, if I'm just remembering correctly. We are not looking for church leaders. We are looking for our sermon, for people to follow their Christian conscience in making church decisions. So there are a um, there's a box, I think, there's a box on the table back there with some sheets of paper that you can make nominations, and I think also at this table that, um, remember, you can write your own name down. And since we have all these varying uh, terms, if you just want a sample video of an elder, you can do it for just one year. <laughs> On this coming Wednesday evening, if I heard you, whatever you want to call it, afternoon, evening, there's going to be an in-person uh, symposium on the Christ Call Will visiting writer. Uh, it's going to be Mary Miller. Uh, she is supposedly very, very good. I have not met her yet, but she has a huge resume. Uh, it's going to be an old thing, and it's going to be outside. Except I think it's good right. We will be inside, we will be masked, and we will be socially distanced. It was in the paper, I think you don't see. Uh, and I do hope that you can come, but it will also be on WebEx. And Carol is going to post that on the Thank you. Schedule the congregational meeting. We have to give you official notice two Sundays. Uh, so it won't actually be official this Sunday because <laughs> we haven't actually scheduled it. But uh, it should be the September 27th meeting. 
could all of it be in session. Uh, the congregational meeting at which you would vote on uh, your new pastor. So that would be super exciting. And then uh, she would uh, hopefully would get a transition to place where she would come sometime in mid October. So I know people have been wondering what all the plan is. So we're, we're working on the plan. Uh, hopefully, you will have a meeting. It will be hybrid so that folks can attend as well electronically. Um, if you, so the two Sundays notice can officially include a, a Sunday morning before the meeting. <laughs> so uh, that's how we work that out. Um, so uh, we're hoping to, to do that and, and have a meeting and get people uh, on board. And then, as Don said, we pray for um, the wonderful work of being the church of a first call pastor, which is a wonderful mission opportunity for you all to be a teaching and loving place as you encourage her in her ministry and as she serves you. So it's such a wonderful celebration. And of course, we will work on uh, transition celebrations as well. Of course, I would like to party with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, anyway, that's that's kind of where we are, and we will have definite plans that we will communicate in every way possible. So, um, okay, let us bless one another. As God's chosen ones, holy, beloved, and claimed to the waters of baptism, clothe yourselves with humility, compassion, kindness, and patience. Forgive one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. And above all things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. Would you stand and sing with us? Thank you.